Welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. I'm Reed. Reed, this intro's going to be short because we said we were going to do a riff episode as a test to see if we could do something. I'm proud of us. Yeah, that was 24 minutes. Yeah. Could you believe it? That could be a record. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like when we used to do the, shoot, what did you call Digital snacks. And we're like, these are going to be 10 minute episodes. And it was like 72 minutes later. Yeah. yeah. Right. I remember Brian looking at us. He was like, you know, he didn't actually hold up like and do the watch sign, like <laughs> tapping his watch, but it was in his eyes or he's like, you're way past the yeah. snack. <laughs> you guys could never be on cable television. <laughs> Go to commercial. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. Well, anyways, cable this, access. Yeah. You know. This is a fun uh, like riff episode on the on a book that Reed recently read. So anyways, hope you like it. All right. Yeah. All right, Reed, we are testing a uh, random <laughs> podcast riff session. Um, we thought like it could be fun at times to do like a 10 minute episode on something. And you were, you just finished reading the book uh, from Peter Thiel, zero to one. And you were talking about uh, contrarian. And so you said you wanted to get into, uh, well, I guess contrarian against, was it specifically MVP that you wanted to talk about or circumstance? Well, probably the MVP. I, I need to think more because I feel like there was elements that he was willing to, I guess, agree to on uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, outlier book, but then there were some parts borderline taking shots, uh, which made me wonder what their relationship is, if they have one at all, because I think they both went to Stanford. Um, you know, so that from that West Coast, you know, Silicon Valley group. But um, yeah, I, I was fascinated to hear him talk about the MVP mentality that is now, you know, kind of gospel out in Silicon Valley. You know, you're, you shouldn't be building too far down because, and it gets into that, uh, God, definite optimism and, um, you know, definite negativism. Like he was talking about different cultures and how they see things and how that plays into this MVP mentality. And uh, I should have studied my notes, which I don't even <laughs> Well, let any. me explain. So first zero to one is Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel oh, is part of you. the, the PayPal ma mafia. <laughs> uh, PayPal mafia are the, the like four to six guys or whatever that started PayPal that went off and started a bunch of other companies like um, Elon Musk. And, there were uh, seven. Hoffman. He seven. named seven and each one now has a company that's worth over a billion dollars. Yeah. So pretty nice little cohort there. Uh, take that Stanford. Um, although several of them did go to Stanford. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. Uh, so Zero to One was his, I don't know if it's his first book, but it's, I think it's the most popular book, at least. Uh, where, Without a doubt. Yeah, uh, basically it's, his whole theory is you should work on building a product or a company that goes from did not, nothing like this existed before to it exists. So going from zero to one versus having like competing with other people, like deciding as we just did an episode on how to build another ILS, he would not recommend building another ILS, even if it looks like it could be fruitful because you're just going up against more competition and basically uh, you're constraining yourself. So it's the key, one of the key, I guess, like concepts, but um, he definitely believes in, in becoming a monopoly if possible and then dominating a niche. And to start, do you always, I never asked you this. Did I niche or niche? It, it can go either way. All right. I was for a while like on a niche thing and then I was like, well, actually plenty. It's yeah. accepted both ways. All right. Well, I don't like quiches. So, so there's nothing contrarian there. about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things in the book that you were reminding me, because it's been years since I read it, uh, was that MVP, which means minimum viable product. In, um, in the tech industry, a lot of people believe and subscribe to this one book that's called The Lean Startup. And The Lean Startup is all about building these the most minimum viable product you can before uh, and launching it and getting feedback. So it's the whole like Facebook famous Zuckerberg quote, but uh, go fast and break stuff basically like put it out there before you think it's ready. Um, and I think Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn also subscribes to that, but then you have people on the other side, like Peter Thiel or Steve jobs from Apple. Steve jobs would not, you know, would famously did not accept mediocrity. He just wanted like it to be perfect when it got into your hands. So I think the overall discussion is how much do you believe in an MVP versus, uh, well, like, a, I get what's the other side of it, not MVP, but just something more. He big. didn't have a name as much as he just said, a, a long-term vision and plan, not just a vision, but he emphasized the long-term planning that Steve Jobs did, like, and that that was really the, the key ingredient or mindset that he held that uh, very few do or did. 
And, and today it hasn't changed. Like it's still an MVP mindset. And he said, it's got a lot to do. I believe I have this right, but just with the venture, um, you know, the pressures that that puts you under, um, mm -hmm. you know, even though most, most in that world understand you're looking at like 10 year horizons and returns and things like that, but that, you know, you, you don't have the time. And if you don't, if you haven't put in the money yourself, that you're just on the clock and that people are acting like it's about feedback, but um, he said it's also very much driven by capital. So um, I'll tell you, d my stance on this probably would change it where I am in my life and also what kind of product or company I'm building, right? So like at this point in my life, I definitely value stability, even though I don't have the family like you have. <laughs> um, I value in uh, doing what I say I'm gonna do um, and getting people to, to buy in and trust me. And so right now I'm more on the, I'd want a longer time horizon of both a company and the product. Um, earlier, I, I kind of, they, a lot of interviews always ask you like, what would you have told yourself? Like when you were 20, I would have definitely said, take more risk. Cause I was definitely, you always tease Lurch, our uh, chief data officer about being, you know, very conservative. I feel even though a lot of my actions seemed non-conservative and very risk takey I was at in, internally very conservative when I was in my 20s. And I sort of, it would have been nice to take some bigger shots or swings then and get some scar tissue. Um, although I certainly have some scar tissue. <laughs> and then now uh, allow for this. But if if we ever moved on from Digible, I think at that point, I may be in a position then where I'm back to the go fast and break stuff mentality. So more of the the MVP. But I could also see myself like if I just had just some sort of like real pet of a project, I may say like this one, I'm going to take my time and get perfect. Um, which I feel in some instances, uh, Rand Fishkin, so who we've read his book, Lost and Founder and liked, liked a lot. Um, he at Moz wishes he was more MVP focused, but in his new company, he said he could not take that approach. And he said, cause he had built so much of a brand now that when he put out a product, he got like a million subscribers uh, when he put out his new product, like his email list. And he was like, I can't go out there with just garbage because they're not going to give me <laughs> another shot. This is my mm -hmm. brand on the line. So I'm going to take my time and make it work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting too. Like if you get, if you become too successful, people are really watching your next thing. So um, great point. I think about the guy from last thing I'll pass it to you, but the guy from Evernote, he, I know you're an Evernote fan. That's why I bring it up, but he sold Evernote, did quite well. And he's done a couple of other companies since, but he's now launching a new, uh, Man, I hate the name of this company, but it's called mm -hmm, like oh M M H M M or whatever. But the whole point is That's like to, to, revol uh, to revolutionize video. So like so that kind of like what we did with the first um, webinar where we could move our heads around on the screen. But basically, you could be in a Zoom and like put all the PowerPoint slides up behind you, or move yourself around, or act like you're on a green screen like presenting. Mm. Um, and it's gotten a lot of traction. I think in uh, the first like month of his launch, he got venture capital to give him like 3 million bucks or something to build out the, the prototype. But um, it's because he's got such a reputation at this point, right? So you take his approach where you're like, whatever, I'm going to name a company, something silly. And I'm just going to like go out there or do you go the, uh, the Rand Fishkin way? So. Well, that's a great, answer. great point. Um, observation. Uh, he was speaking like the book was directed at, at folks, I think more considering, you know, startup, like building, you know, a company. So he didn't factor for himself or, you know, although he mentioned Elon Musk and he said, you know, he's moved to, you always mentioned Mars, but like mm -hmm. his stuff's long-term planning. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, he's way more jobs, you know, it's not quick MVPs for him and seeing what sticks like that's. And I don't think this, we should probably qualify. This uh, does not, suggests that Steve Jobs wasn't, you know, doing some pretty, like, wasn't flexible, fluid, you know, um, I mean, everybody, I think Opportunist. Know, yeah, everybody think knows his reputation, but um, the clear distinction is like what we saw with Airbnb and, you know, Victor, our head of engineering, he showed me this example as he was trying to hit me and David hard, but probably me even harder about the MVP mindset or mentality. And he was like, look at what they first published. And it was, you know, I'll just say a shit show. It looked terrible to me. Um, but he was like, this is exactly, you know, the kind of mindset we need to have. And he showed me five more Ted talk videos or whatever, all this stuff pointing this. And that's exactly what Peter Thiel was saying. He was like, 
your head of engineering is right there with everyone else, all the other sheep. <laughs> and I love Victor. I don't, you know, but that's, that's what he's saying. Cause he seemed more in the camp and, you know, easy, but it's an example of one, you know, what can happen if you're Steve Jobs or if you have long-term planning built in. But he did, then I remember he referenced Musk as another example. He's like, these guys are visionaries, but they're also maniacal about their planning um, to get there. And you lose that, you know, if you're under this, like under the gun, like all we're looking for is some, some type of validation and feedback. And then it also, I think, blurs like your strategic thinking on what's could happen around you, like in the competitive landscape. Um, you know, you almost have blinders on. That's, that's what he's saying with MVP. My, uh, this is all definitely related, but my issue, I'm going to say specifically, and Victor's not here to argue the point, thank God, because we never get off. <laughs> Love you, Victor. <laughs> this is that second time I said that. <laughs> um, but is, you know, aren't you somewhat sabotaging the your your feedback if you prematurely bring something out? And I think you're great. You, I know you can speak for him, David, but... Um, you know, I've said the phrase a million times, test responsibly. And I, I took it that way maybe too much. But as we've looked at our own technology, it's like, is it better to get, and I'll be very specific here, to get out a health score um, knowing that, you know, of course we know more than anybody else. But if we feel like it's fundamentally flawed, um, is it still worth putting out there? Because- What do you in, mean by Fundamentally. Like, wouldn't you not even do a product if you thought it was flawed? By fundamentally, like you could have a flawed product and put it out there, but if it's fun from the fundamentals, it's flawed. Why would you? Why would we fair, put it out? Fair, fair, fair. Has major warts, <laughs> <laughs> but not fundamentally flawed. You're right. In concept, why even do it? So we believed enough in the concept, but if we didn't mature it well enough, and therefore it it didn't produce. I mean, isn't it again self serving prophecy sabotaging? the feedback, if you, if you know that it, it's not far enough. So then it becomes very subjective to me. When do you know that it's matured well enough to really test it? And that's where it gets hard. I just think it gets hard because Victor, you know, frequently it's like, it's ready, you know, and we've seen this with, you know, your other half and in our department, like, you know, account management saying, why the hell did we release that? Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes it's more, you know, training related, but it's also been, that wasn't ready for prime time, mm -hmm. you know, the Google analytics tag, you know, when we first rolled that out. So, um, yeah, tell, give, give it, give us the other side. Cause I lean a little more towards the strategic long-term planning. Well, I think, I think Musk is a really interesting example because uh, a lot of people think Elon is kind of like crazy. Uh, but as you're, as you mentioned, he kind of, he does have a long-term vision. So what seems crazy in the moment is connected. It's not just him fla floundering. Right. Um, and so I believe in, if you're going to build a, if you're trying to build a company, I think that's what you need. If you're just kind of like an engineer that's tinkering with a side project of a problem, I think you can go MVP all day long. So I think there's differences. Like when you look at the lean startup handbook with the MVP, I think a lot, a lot of times that's catering towards like the one man engineer that's doing this at night, nights and weekends, and they're playing with a toy. And it's like, in that sense, like, yeah, get it out there. But if you're like going forward with a brand and trying to make a real company, <laughs> I think that's when you have to have that long-term strategic vision or, or the consequences don't matter to you any, anymore. Like me in my twenties where I could have taken some risks and fallen down and gotten back up or someone that's like finally like Evernote or whatever, where he's like, whatever, I'm, I just got FU money now. So I'm just going to put like name something. Mm -hmm, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, oh man, it really God. grates me. Uh, so I, that's where I think uh, that matters. So I don't know if that was really the counter, I guess at that point, but no, but that that's helpful. And you know, so, I believe oh, the book, uh, sorry, but pretty sure the book is, is talking company, not, not just some engineer tinkering on the side. Right. It's like, if you're looking to build a company, you shouldn't be taking an MVP mindset. Right. You know, the way these engineers in Silicon Valley and a lot of startups do. He's like, if you put more thought into it, which again, I do, I do this sometimes, but not to tap ourselves on the back, but we've been thinking, I think it's fair, not an MVP way with Digible. I mean, yes, we have the product, you know, that lives within it, but our, our thinking, and I believe it is part of why we've seen success is we've had, we have a longer term vision and our employees see that they get on board with it. And while we move rapidly on some products, there's others that we have just 
kept chipping away and improving and improving. So here's where it's different. Um, meaning if you were building an incubator, then I think you can also do the MVP because it's like, sure. all right, we're just testing. That's what it's all ideas. about. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I've seen this with companies before, like, act, well, meaning I'm just trying to hit the point. Like you're saying, if you're building a long lasting company where they have a small like R and D department or incubator department, and when they launch stuff, they launch it under a different name, different brand. And that's how they do the MVP test. And then if it, if it seems to get traction and they want it to become a real thing, then they move it to their real brand. <laughs> and they're like, all right, nope, this is a real product. We have tested it over here. And You've we've graduated got back. Yep. Yeah. And then you just put a redirect on that other site or whatever. So I, that's the way I'd feel more comfortable because then it's not the whole, um, geez, I forget what, we, what we've called it before, but you're just not, um, it's like as you spread out to other products, like everybody, like you start diluting your specialty more and more. Right. And so testing all these ideas like Google, I think, could really benefit from this. Right. Like they have a thousand products, it seems like, and they kill a lot of them. And mm -hmm. every time someone gets excited about something, it feels like it dies off. Right. So, yes, from Google, you have a great distribution channel, because if you make a new Gmail or something, everyone's going to try it out. Ooh, this guy has Google's brand behind it. But now, as we've talked about before, their brand to me has taken a hit. So anytime they launch something new, I'm like, yeah, cool. I'll check it out in five years. Like that's my horizon for them because they'll let it sit for three years and finally kill it. <laughs> totally. But I don't want to get adopted to it otherwise. So if Google had gone, to, goes to market and tested it small and then brought it underneath the Google banner, I'd have much more respect for it because I knew like, okay, now you've decided you're going to keep this thing. Yeah, great point. Seven powers, right? Brand dilution. Mm -hmm. You actually risk more if you get too carried away with like, you know, the, uh, the thousand. <laughs> right. So is there Different a shots. product- uh, I know we got to wrap this up, but is there a product or a type of product with like a digital that you don't mind taking MVPs with? Because I think there's a difference with the product also versus a feature. So maybe hit that real quick. You want me to use real examples? Like, well, I'm just saying, like, if we were going to go into websites, something I'm noodling on, like, I don't think we would say, let's do an MVP of a website. I feel like that's a sacred cow <laughs> yeah. to me in a way where it's like, all right, we got to do websites. Well, Great point. Okay. Great point. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been floating this on and off for the last 90 days, I'll say, but the recruitment thing, um, I don't think that, that should be a good example. I don't see it as a feature. I see it more like the fair housing, you know? Um, so that's its own product. It's not just a feature of Fiona. Um, and I think a recruitment product, I'd be comfortable with an MVP approach versus website. Great example, long-term, like this is an all in kind of venture. We can't just jack around and like see what the market bears. Cause it's already too established of a product, which is interesting because then we're getting back to the zero to one. It's like, well, if it's a new product, then shouldn't you lean more MVP, you know, because you're not dealing with the expectations of a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Whereas with website, everybody's got one. So it's like, you're immediately like dealing with that. Therefore, don't you have to be thinking more in long-term planning more strategically, right? Versus this doesn't exist. Why should we be building long-term, which is what is so contrarian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love it, you know, um, whether he's wrong or right about him actually saying, look at jobs. You know, he didn't take, you know, hey, the iPhone's never been invented, right? Uh, iPads, you know, uh, et cetera. But he still went, he still didn't take an MVP approach. He did take a long-term, which takes, you know, courage and obviously resources. Mm -hmm. But that also... Um I think there's two other things that the book doesn't really hit, but with, or I don't remember anyways, but um, if you are Peter Thiel um, and you're going to build something new, every, all those eyes are going to be on it like we discussed. And he's also probably attacking a massive market. So I know he says, go after a niche and dominate it. Different than apartments, right? Like apartments is big, but it's not as big as what Palantir is hitting, right? Like that's that's different. And so I think uh, when you when you're Apple, you also can't really do that small iterative approach because first impressions is everything. And like your keynotes, you have millions of people tuning into. So if you put out a half-assed project to <laughs> to a keynote, it, it's like that really kills your brand. It's like, oh, this is what was so special. You know, 10 million people to, it's like a Super Bowl. Event, totally. Right. So uh, I think that's different versus again, back to the engineer on the side or just someone that's goofing around. And I think then you can, if, if it's a smaller niche, in a way, if the niche is smaller, I think it almost, it has to be either, if it's as big as apartments, I think it has to be in some ways more baked because you can't burn a bunch of first impressions. If it's um, 
if it's smaller than apartments, then maybe there's no competition. And so now you're that little tinkerer on the side and you're like, all right, I, you know, beggars can't be choosers, right? Cause like nothing exists for you guys. Right. Therefore <laughs> you're lucky I built this. Right. I am going to find a way to get niche and quiche into the next poem. <laughs> I'm just telling you that now. <laughs> um, yeah, he, uh, he he was saying, and I can't speak for was it Palantir or yeah, but he said that with PayPal they went to um, just some like a select group of the uh, auctioners on eBay. He's like, so we proved it on eBay at the time it was certainly getting bigger, but I don't know if he could say the same thing about you know Palantir, but he he definitely in the book was like, you have to go to a small market, you know, to prove it. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the whole MVP mindset too. It's like, you know, like you said, it's like, you can't do that now. And I meant, mentioned that to Victor. I was like, so where is a company, if you get to Airbnb, right? We saw how ugly the first product was. Now it's beautiful. Now what are their thoughts about new features? Cause you said, let's, you know, separate. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to know that, you know, what, what's his stance and it's not in the book, but that one I'm struggling with now with our own product. It's like, we're no longer the ugly orange and whatever it was. <laughs> it's, it's. And remember when we first saw the, the first colors of Fiona is what you're talking about. It was yeah, like purple, well, orange and like silvery or something. And I remember when I first stressful. saw it, I was like, it looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because it was so magical that something yeah. that we whiteboarded like appeared. I was like, it looks amazing. <laughs> of course it's way better now, but yeah. So I feel like we can't be as cavalier or, you know, that's not how Victor would put it, but MVP mindsetted when we put new stuff out there. Cause it's like, there's actually people using this and there's an expectation. So yeah. Back to some authority. I'd be, I guess that'd be a separate conversation we should have with Victor, <laughs> but like at what, what big company can do the beta test or people are happy with it. Right. Cause I can't imagine, like, I don't see a Microsoft doing beta tests on things. You've right. talked about though, I think it's most, it's been you, not him, but about Facebook, right? How they oh, have, yeah. what is it? 10? They have like more the than 10,000 tests running at a time. They have tests with as little as I thought as it was 40,000 or something, but it was a huge number. Yeah. yeah. But it, they built it because they have so much from scale to do that at the beginning. And it's not right. with product launches. It's generally with the algorithm, like what's being featured in the algorithm. Mm. It might be with like Seems a like different like button or something, but mm. it's not like a whole Instagram clone or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, okay. I didn't realize that. So it's more, it's just like how you get better engagement is what they're testing constantly. So I think there could be areas like you pick and choose like that. So like Salesforce, you know, they do like one big release a year. They're not going to like, <laughs> like do that on an MVP, right? right. Uh, or do like change the core of their system with something like that. It, um, Have you seen the social dilemma? Uh, a third of it. I got really upset at how, <laughs> like uh, how they were over dramatizing it. <laughs> that annoyed me too. So we're we're aligned. It was on like that. misinformation. I was like, "Are you? <laughs> you know how people are going to take this?" Yeah. Well, um, I count on you uh, to, and I know you could have if you chose to, but just cut through that bullshit. I think we yeah. understand the space well enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I watched all the way through, and I wasn't asking as much for an opinion on the whole thing, but I'm glad you gave it. Uh, as I was, and this is part of the dramatization, but did you notice the dude from Mad Men was, uh, they brought in like one of the main actors from Mad Men to play the role of the, uh, algorithm master at Facebook. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's like, I, the, I, the, yeah, I don't remember that part, but was it, which guy was it? The silver hair? Or the... No, uh, not obviously, uh, whatever is the main guy. Um, and not, not the, not the, not the two main guys, uh, Sterling and what yeah, the hell okay, is. Okay. Um, but the kind of sleazy guy, um, the young up and comer oh, must be partner. See, that would have just set me off more on the show. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, oh, you chose. Yeah. Although that's good casting. Yeah, you know, <laughs> he, he was great. He nailed it. Um, and it was kind of like uh, what you might call it, um, the Pixar with the uh, Inside Out. Oh yeah, have you seen that? Uh, you have it on my list now because I had never, I didn't even know it came freaking out. Freaking wonderful! And then, uh, it's genius. You were just going off on it. I'll so. be. You know, I think we could still be friends if you don't like that, but that would hurt. Um, but it it works that way where they have him kind of inside the brain of Facebook, jacking with everyone uh, else's brains, yeah. though. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, it was well done. Yeah. I did see like the part where they were like, it was almost like they were acting like they're interns behind the scenes that were like pushing buttons. And I was like, that's what started driving me nuts. But I should finally, I should just finish it. So I don't have to give the qualifier the first third, but uh, <laughs> maybe I can get through it now. Yep. Yep. All, All right. right, Reed. Well, that was fun. Let's get out of here. Yep. Good stuff. Yeah.